in this segment we are going to discuss the implications of the intermolecular uh, forces of interaction that exist between molecules and the first property I want to discuss is viscosity. Viscosity is basically the resistance of a liquid to flow. So one way to measure this, you know, if you have, let's say, two different liquids, suppose you have um, water and you have paint thinner, okay? What you can do is take a plate, the regular dinner plate, place a drop of water, place a drop of the paint thinner, and then make the plate vertical. And you can measure um, the speed with which um, the water flows and the speed with which the paint thinner flows, those will be different. And it's got to do with the forces of interaction that are existent in between water molecules and in between paint thinner. So just to, you know, put things in perspective, just to kind of put um, pictures to, uh, or structures rather, because this is chemistry. Um, in case of water, you hopefully anticipate, since there is a hydrogen directly bonded to an electronegative element such as oxygen, this is going to suffer off hydrogen bonding. So that's a pretty strong force of interaction. That means uh, water will resist to flow. And if you compare that to paint thinner, um, which is pretty nonpolar because all it contains is carbon and hydrogen atoms. So and you, can you can take gasoline if you want. Um, and in that case, you will mainly have London dispersion forces. And so since the dispersion forces um, are going to dispersion forces. They're not uh, going to hold, um, you know, two molecules as tightly uh, together as compared to the water molecules in case of hydrogen bonding because it's obviously a stronger force of interaction. Um, paint thinner is expected to, um, to, or gasoline, whichever is the nonpolar component that is expected to go travel faster. So greater is the is the forces of interaction that are present in between molecules greater will be the viscosity. Uh, if you don't like paint thinner or gasoline, think about, um, you know, maybe visine, uh, uh, which contains glycerin or, or uh, ethylene glycol, uh, the structure of which is, so if you consider ethylene glycol, that's OH, and another H. So if H2O contains one set of hydrogen bond, hopefully you can see this guy is going to show a hydrogen bond here as well as there. So since you have greater amount of hydrogen bonding in case of ethylene glycol, which is your antifreeze, ethylene glycol, that's going to travel even slower as compared to water. So, you know, this is like a little exercise that you can have, you, you can do if you wish to, or envision at least, you can, um, if, 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 I, if I were to make it test worthy, I would say, um, you're given water, you're given, um, you're given C9H20, you're given H2O, and you're given glycerol or glycol, either of the two. And you have to arrange them in their increasing uh, viscous behavior. Um, and so basically you're talking about the dispersion forces as compared to the hydrogen bonding in case of water and the extra additional hydrogen bonds in case of glycerol, which is going to make it really thick and really um, viscous. So realize that if you have nonpolar molecules, they have weak intermolecular forces and hence they will have low viscosity and that would mean that they are free-flowing. So um, in polar molecules which have stronger forces of interaction or greater number of forces of interaction are going to have higher viscosity. Now, a good example uh, from day-to-day -day life um, that covers viscosity is motor oil. Motor oil. Motor oil. So, y y you may have noticed, perhaps, when you go for an oil change, um, the mechanic would ask you, um, 
what 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 code do you have like what number uh, oil like a 10w40 5w40 5w30 etc uh, what exactly does that number mean essentially that number measures um, the the viscosity so thinner motor oils they have an, as it's called, SAE rating, which is for Society of Automotive Engineers. The SAE rating um, for thin motor oils would be like 5 or 10, uh, and it can go as high as up to even, even 50. So earlier, um, you know, in probably like 50 years ago or so, um, the engines and the kind of motor oils that were available um, were such that seasonal changes would actually affect um, and so this oil and so in the summer months a higher SAE rating was required and in the winter months the lower rating was required. Of course, as science has developed, now there are polymers that are added to um, these motor oils, uh, which have these, when I use the word polymer, by the way, it basically means that uh, poly is for multi, mer is for unit. So it basically means that these are long molecules which repeat themselves. So one, two, three, n number of times, just like a necklace. Um, and so some of these molecules, they can coil at low temperatures and they can unwind at high temperatures. So what that means is because at low temperatures during the winter season, these will remain coiled and so the shape will be con compact and it's not going to show a lot of forces of interaction and is not going to contribute to the oil's viscosity. On the other hand, as the temperature increases and when they unwind uh, they are longer shapes so the longer shapes um, greater would be the forces of interaction and so the molecules can get entangled and um, in, 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 in that case you are going to see um, a decreased viscosity than, than otherwise. And so um, the result is an oil that the viscosity is less temperature temperature dependent. So now, of course, with the advent of science, um, the, the kind of uh, motor oil um, is different as compared to what it was 50 years ago. But realize those numbers that you see when you buy a Supreme brand or whatever it is that you buy um, or your car mechanic uh, adds uh, to, your, to your car, um, that is nothing but a reflection of um, the oil the viscosity of the motor oil that you put in your car, which should be thick enough to adequately coat all engine surfaces to lubricate them. Another property that you can envision perhaps is surface tension. Surface tension is essentially the resistance of a liquid to spread out and increase its surface area. I want you to envision Two scenarios here. Let's say you have a beaker containing water. Okay. There is a molecule here. There are many molecules, of course. So I want you to envision a molecule of water which is present um, in the bulk of the solution. And I also want you to envision the molecules which are at the topmost surface. Now, if you envision the one that is in the bulk, hopefully you can see that there will be molecules that will interact here, here, in this direction, perhaps in that direction, in all directions. And so you can also see that a downward pull is being nullified by an upward pull. A pull on the right-hand side is going to be nullified by a pull on the left-hand side, so on and so forth. But if you look at the molecule which is on the topmost layer, all it can feel is an inward pull. There is nothing to counter on the opposite side because here you have air. And so hopefully you can see that the topmost layer at any given point of time would always feel an inward pull. And this is the source of surface tension. And at any given point of time, um, the, the surface would want to remain contracted. It would want to remain uh, or minimize 
the surface area. That's also the reason why uh, raindrops are spherical in nature. Raindrops are not cubical or cylindrical or conical, etc. They are always spherical um, in, in shape. And the reason for that is that a sphere has the minimum surface area of all the geometric shapes. A sphere has the minimum surface area. Hopefully you remember that from, from geometry in school. So, um, again, surface tension. This is caused due to differences of intermolecular forces that are experienced in the surf at the surface and in the interior bulk, as I showed you. Um, and uh, in that sense, surface molecules, they will feel an overall inward attraction because of which, um, because of which the surface area is going to essentially, um, get minimized. Um, you can also perhaps, uh, think about, uh, you know, like a little game you might have played as a, as a kid where you can take a beaker of water again and you can try to place a paper clip you know on the surface and even though it's made of metal it actually stays there it doesn't uh, sink uh, very uh, very easily and you have to you have to tap on the side or you have to provide the energy uh, basically to break the surface tension and then the uh, paper clip is going to sink i i, I don't know if you guys have uh, played that before, but I did that when I was little. So try that now. Um, if you if you place on the the paper clip on top of um, water very carefully, it is going to float and uh, tap on the side, and that will be enough energy to break that surface tension, and um, the paper clip in that case is going to um, fall and sink to the bottom. Uh, another application of surface tension, uh, let's see, uh, the cleansing action of soap, that is based on surface tension. Uh, water, of course, has hydrogen bonding, um, and so it suffers of uh, greater forces of interaction. And uh, soap, which uh, has a hydrophobic end, this is hydrophobic, hydrophobic and it has a hydrophilic head hydrophilic philic head so in a sense we are saying that the head of the soap is very polar and these long tails these are nonpolar the nonpolar end is what interacts with the grease the polar end is what interacts with water and uh, soap in that sense basically decreases the surface tension uh, that is present in water. So when you mix soap um, with water, uh, essentially water now starts to interact with the soap causing um, a decrease in the surface tension which facilitates the cleansing action of soap. While we are discussing sur surface tension, let's also discuss capillary action, which is kind of like an offshoot of, uh, uh, of this, since it stems from the attractive uh, forces within the molecules. Um, capillary action essentially is a result of two uh, kinds of forces, combination of two kinds of forces. The attraction between uh, molecules in the liquid, which are also referred to as cohesive forces. Cohesive forces. These are attractive forces. Attractive forces within the liquid. And adhesive forces. Adhesive forces. These are attractive forces uh, between the molecules, attractive forces between the molecules of the liquid, of liquid, and, and the surface of the tube.
Basically, you might have uh, an application of this would be um, uh, you, you, you might have when you go for, you know, like a blood uh, drawing sample. Um, essentially, the medical technician uh, pokes the patient's finger with a pin, squeezes some blood out of the puncture, and then collects the blood in a thin tube. Um, when the tube's tip comes in contact with blood, the blood is drawn inside of the tube, so it starts to rise. Um, the, same is, the same force is, it plays an important role um, in how trees and plants and shrubs, um, they draw water from the soil through the roots. So capillary action is essentially um, a phenomenon that you would see because of an interplay between the attractive forces within the liquid. So if the attractive forces are strong, then one molecule is going to pull another molecule. Um, and also an interplay, the interplay is with adhesive forces. I mean, the liquid is also supposed to rise up. That's, that's equally important. Now, you can perhaps envision that an adhesive force would cause the liquid to spread over the surface of the tube, whereas the cohesive forces would cause the liquid to stay together because it's between the molecules um, of the liquid. Uh, if the adhesive forces are greater than the cohesive forces, um, then you would see the attraction to the surface and so your meniscus is going to rise up a little bit. On the other hand, if the cohesive forces within the liquid are going to be higher, then you're going to see essentially an inverted meniscus, inverted meniscus. So, in case of mercury, for example, if you consider mercury and you fill it in a tube, um, the cohesive forces are stronger as compared to the adhesive forces, and the meniscus is inverted. Uh, so, in a thermometer, for example, or a barometer, you would be able to see this. Um, on the other hand, in a glass tube, all of you have used a burette or a pipette, and you can, or a measuring cylinder, and you can perhaps see that the meniscus is always this concave shape uh, because in that case, the adhesive forces in case of water are stronger as, compa as compared to the cohesive forces within water, um, which is why water will have a tendency to um, wet the, the, um, the walls of uh, the glass tube that it's kept in. Also realize, thinner would be the tube, greater would be the rise, higher will be the rise that uh, the liquid would experience. Okay, next what I want to do is um, have you think about phase changes and how we can um, apply the concept of intermolecular forces of interaction um, to make it go from, you know, a solid to liquid to gas. Um, recall from general chemistry one, these six uh, phase changes, fusion, which was um, similar to another word for essentially melting of um, a solid to a liquid. The opposite of that, that is liquid becoming solid, would be called freezing. Likewise, vaporization is conversion of a liquid into a gas. Condensation is the opposite of that, which is condensation of a gas into a liquid. Uh, so, for instance, water vapor essentially condenses into uh, clouds. So, cloud formation is, is an example of condensation. Sublimation, that's direct conversion of a solid into a gas. So, a great example of this would be mothballs. If you don't know what they are, I would very strongly encourage you to go to the laundry section of Walmart um, and look for what are called as moth balls. Um, great value is the name of the company. These are, this is what is, uh, essentially kept in, um, you know, to, to, pre to prevent, uh, the attack of, uh, silverfish and other insects, uh, onto your winter clothing. Uh, so this should remind you of your grandma's, uh, trunk, basically. Um, deposition, gas to solid. 
so that's the formation of frost. Um, hopefully you can envision that. Um, I want you to now think about intermolecular forces that would be present in solids, in liquids, and in gases. So let's, let's think about that for a second. Solid, liquid, and gas. I've discussed this before, but at a molecular level, hopefully you can see that in case of solids, molecules are right next to each other. There's basically no room for any more compression. In case of liquids, they are somewhat far apart, so there is some movement. In case of gases, they are really far apart, so you can really apply pressure to bring these molecules close to each other. That means if you wanted to go from solid to a liquid, you will have to apply heat. Likewise, if you wanted to go from um, liquid to gas, you would have to apply heat or you would have to reduce pressure, one or the other. Reduce pressure. And likewise, if you wanted to go from gas to liquid, you would have to increase pressure or take away heat, decrease heat. And likewise, from liquid to solid, you will have to take away heat, decrease heat. So you'll have to cool it. In terms of forces of interaction, how the, or how does this sort of um, interplay? Realize that since in case of gases, the gas molecules are far apart, um, they are almost oblivious to the presence of other gas molecules. And so they don't feel the intermolecular forces of interaction. Um, on the other hand, in case of liquid, you would expect to uh, the liquid to see some forces of interaction. And in case of solids, of course, they are touching each other. So um, you, you, you have those experience greater um, forces or great test in the three phases here. So hopefully you can also envision that in going from solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas, you would call the process an endothermic process because you're providing heat to the system. Likewise, gas condensing into liquid or liquid condensing into solid uh, or rather depositing into uh, a gas depositing into a solid or a liquid freezing into um, a solid, uh, that would also be an exothermic process because you're decreasing heat from the system and uh, so the delta H in this case is going to be a negative sign the delta H in case of solid to liquid the delta H is going to be a positive sign recall this delta H basically means the enthalpy um, from 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 general chemistry one we discussed that at length there so what decides whether a given process is going to occur naturally on its own uh, or not? Recall from general chemistry one, we made a statement there that uh, essentially any time there is a decrease in energy, that's a good thing from the system because everything in the universe uh, is moving towards stability and low energy basically means greater stability. Um, but would that mean that um, all endothermic processes are not going to occur on their own? Uh, the answer to that is no, that is not true. One more time, in case you missed what I, what I just said. I said that in general chemistry 1, delta H enthalpy was considered to be a prime factor uh, that if it decreases, it leads to stability. But the question is, does that mean that if you have endothermic processes for which the delta H is going to increase, there will be absorption of heat, would those never occur? Would such processes, processes, processes not occur? And the answer to that is no. Those processes do occur. A great example of that is just evaporation. Of course, we know that during summer months, uh, water evaporates pretty quickly. But even during winter time, if you, um, if you take uh, some water in a little bowl and maybe put it in a corner in your kitchen and um, visit it, you know, maybe 
a week later. That water would have gone. You did not supply uh, any kind of heat, but that water evaporated on its own. What's going on is the question. Turns out that it's not just enthalpy that decides um, whether a certain process is going to occur on its own. There is an, an additional factor which is called as entropy, delta S entropy, which measures the degree of randomness, the degree of disorderliness. And then, since in case of evaporation, you're going from a liquid to a gas form, liquid is a more contained, more ordered arrangement, gas is kind of all over the place, uh, you would say that the amount of disorderliness has increased. And increase in entropy is always a good thing for natural processes. We are going to discuss this uh, in a little bit more detail in chapter 18, um, but um, we are just visiting uh, for the purpose of phase changes, we are, we are visiting the delta H and delta S. So both entropy and enthalpy can be connected to each other um, using what is called as the Gibbs free uh, energy relationship, delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. And if you knew um, the value of delta H and delta S, you would be able to calculate the delta G at a given temperature. Um, for all naturally occurring processes, this delta G should be a negative number. All right? Okay. Like I said in the previous slide, for all naturally occurring processes, that means those that occur on their own. I just gave you an example that evaporation of water even at 5 degrees Celsius occurs on its own. The rate is really, really slow, but it occurs on its own. So that would be called a spontaneous process. The delta G will be negative for that. Of course, if you increase, if you provide the, the heat and if the temperature is increased, uh, you would see um, that the speed with which that evaporation takes place increases, absolutely. Um, but even at lower temperatures, uh, even though the rate is small, that doesn't mean that the reaction is not taking place. On the other hand, if you think about, um, you know, perhaps a rock which is at the bottom of the hill, now envision that it's going, it's climbing up, you know, up on top of the hill. That is not going to occur on its own. You probably will need some kind of a crane or some kind of a device which will carry it to the top of the hill. It's not going to occur on its own. So let's say you have a hill, you have a rock. Tumbling down the hill is a natural process. Putting it back uh, on top of the hill is an unnatural process. The delta G is going to be plus for that. So anytime delta G is positive, it's an unnatural process. On the other hand, uh, anytime delta G is negative, it is a spontaneous process. That means at equilibrium, and all phase changes are equilibrium, delta G is equal to zero. If delta G is equal to zero, then according to the Gibbs free energy, you can say that is, uh, I'm using the Gibbs free energy here. So I'm setting Delta G is equal to zero, and so that would mean that you can calculate the value of the temperature if you had the delta H and the delta S numbers with you. All right, let's put things perspective through a heating curve for water. What we have is we have a sample of ice which is maintained at a temperature of negative 25 degrees Celsius. Now, as you start to heat, and you probably have seen this in General Chemistry 1, as you begin to heat the sample, um, essentially in the beginning till it reaches 0 degrees Celsius, it is going to gather that heat, um, so the ice is going to get warmed up until it hits 0. At 0, the temperature becomes constant, so you can continue to supply heat, but the temperature will become constant. The entire ice will melt to water until the time that happens, the temperature is going to remain constant. Once all of the ice has gotten converted into water, again, it's going to start rising 
and the temperature will increase. If you notice, again, as it hits 100, the temperature is going to become constant till all of um, water gets converted into vapor. And then ultimately, we see heating up of the vapor. So the question is, there's, there's two things uh, to think about. A, if you notice, the amount of heat that is required uh, for ice to water conversion is a lot less as compared to the amount of heat required from water to vapor. Why is that? And this goes back to the forces of interactions uh, that are present in solid, liquid and gases. In case of solids, there is absolutely no movement. And uh, in case of liquids, there is some movement. But in case of gases, molecules are so far apart that like I said previously, they are oblivious to each other's presence. That means now the distance of separation between the molecules is going to be gigantic and you have to overcome those forces of interaction, that hydrogen bonding, which was tethering one uh, H2O molecule to another. And that is the reason why the heat that is required to convert, to overcome that hydrogen bonding in a three-dimensional sense, uh, it, is, it is so large in case of water to gas as compared to uh, ice to water. Um, and I, I already t uh, gave you some information. I said that the temperature becomes constant. If I want you to think about why does the temperature become constant um, as the ice is melting. So during the phase change, why does the temperature become constant? And this is really important for those of you who have to take organic chemistry because we have a couple experiments that are based on this, uh, this property. Realize that when it hits the phase change, essentially all the energy that is being provided is used up by water molecules to overcome those intermolecular forces of interaction. So earlier, when you had just ice, when you had just ice, ice was getting warmed up. But at zero, ice is now also getting changed into water. So there is a phase change that is required. So whatever energy that we provide that is used to break the intermolecular forces of interaction that are present in ice, uh, likewise, when it hits 100 all the energy is being used to break those forces of interaction so that the molecules get free. Um, and that is the reason that the temperature is going to be uh, constant, which is also the reason why temperature is uh, an intensive property. It doesn't depend on the amount of material. Whether you take a glass of water or you take a bucket of water, um, Essentially, the, the temperature uh, at which it will melt or boil will remain constant. Okay. Before I wrap up this uh, segment, I just want to put things in perspective. Delta H for the melting process would be called as delta H fusion and would be the amount of energy required to overcome enough intermolecular forces uh, to convert the solid into a liquid. Likewise, uh, the enthalpy for the vaporization process or boiling would be delta H VAP, uh, which is the amount of energy necessary to convert a liquid into a gas. Now, if you have the delta H and the delta S, like we discussed previously, you would be able to uh, determine the temperature associated with that phase change. So since they're saying that this is a vaporization process, realize all of those six that I talked about, those are phase changes. And you would be able to apply the fact that um, Gibbs free energy, the delta G is zero for such a scenario, which basically means that temperature is going to be equal to Delta H divided by delta S. All you got to keep in mind is usually enthalpy is given in kilojoules, whereas um, entropy is given in joules. So make sure that the units are um, exactly the same. So 29.2 times a thousand just to convert the kilojoules into joules per mole. And I'm going to divide that number 
by 87.5 joules per Kelvin per mole. So joules and mole are going to get canceled off and I'm going to punch in on my calculator. And that gives me 333.7 Kelvin. If you wanted to convert that into degrees Celsius, of course you will need to subtract the 273.15 from, from there and that will give you 60.56 degree Celsius um, as your final uh, answer.